We are in Colossians chapter 4, and our reading is verses 2 through 6. This will be the text that Dan preaches from momentarily. So Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, where he writes, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Father, we thank you for the truths in your word and the hope that's in Christ, our precious Savior, our substitute, our treasure. We pray that we would be sanctified in your truth today and that you would help me to proclaim the glories to your name. We pray in Christ's precious grace. Amen. Two questions. What is your role in seeing others come to trust in Christ? The other question is, how is your prayer life? These are two areas in the Christian life that we often feel most defeated in our evangelism and in our prayer. And we're going to talk about both today. The goal, of course, is not for us to lay out a guilt trip. That's easy but to have the word enhance our life in Christ so that we would be the kind of people who have our hearts shaped to be the kind of people who would pray, to be a people whose lives adorn the gospel. And This is really connected to what's your purpose in life. What is the meaning of life? Why are you here? If you've been with us, you've probably heard us talk about what the purpose of the church is. We talk about a threefold purpose, which is upward, inward, and outward. And this is our shorthand way of talking about first, upward, how we were created for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God, to, to see his value as the center of our lives and to live that out in all that we do. And the second aspect is the inward where both individually and a church, we become more and more holy, conform more to the image of Christ, and shaped to be like him. He's not only our savior from sin, but he's our example as well. And finally, third, the outward, we're to be a testimony to the world, pointing others to the hope that's in Christ, calling them to repentance and faith and forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. These are all related to each other. They all reinforce one another. We have God at the center of our lives. We want to be pleasing to him, so we want to walk in his ways, and that shapes us inwardly. And as we live in his ways, we're also called to call others into those ways as well and to see his greatness. And we talk about how that is the purpose of the church. And, of course, the next question is, what's the church? The church is people, those who have trusted in Christ. So if you've trusted in Christ, this is your purpose. Where do you fit into this purpose? How how do you have your life shaped by the, the upward, inward, and outward aspects of what Christ has called us to do? That's what we want to look at today. As we look at the letter to the Colossians, we see an example of a people who have trusted in Christ and their faith made a difference in how they looked at life and how they lived. Going back to chapter 1, and Paul was talking about when he heard of their faith. Verse 4, he said, We've heard about your faith and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. They, they have this love, they have this faith because they've come to embrace the hope of being with their God. They've heard the word of the gospel, the word of truth, God's grace to them. And it's constantly bearing fruit in their lives. This hope of heaven that they have of being with Christ, it shapes them. They've come to trust in Christ 
as the determiner of right and wrong, their Lord, their master. You remember last week we were summarizing this prominent theme in the, the letter to the Colossians here of the lordship of Christ. In the midst of so many competing ways of understanding the world around us, Paul has reminded them that he's the Lord of creation. Verse 15 of chapter 1, he made all things. All things are for him, including you. Verse 18, he's, he's the Lord of the church. He defines what the church is to be and what we're to follow. And then we get to chapter 2, verse 6, and we see that he is the Lord of my life. As you've received Christ Jesus as master, as Lord, so walk in him. Conduct all your life in him, meaning that Christ is the one that you are to follow. We weren't made to live independently. We're we're joined to him like in a marriage. And if you've come to trust in Christ, it, it means you've accepted him as your master. It's the Lord of your life, if if you've understood what it really means to have faith in him. And Paul has been encouraging them and us and teaching us, how does the Lordship of Christ work out in life? Every day. How does this upward treasuring of our God work out in what we do? We've seen it in a number of ways already in this letter. It works out in the inward. Chapter 3, it's about growing in our own holiness. We put off the sinful ways of the world and we put on the right ways, a heart of compassion and love, striving to do everything, 317, do everything, whether in word or deed, in the name of Christ. As those who are his, this inward is grounded in our upward. We're doing it in his name. And then we looked at the importance of that in the home life and the responsibilities there. Fathers, mothers, children, masters, slaves. And now we're going to look at the importance of reaching out to those who don't know Christ. This is the outward. As we see, this, this also flows from the upward too. It's related to our inward. So what we're going to look at today is two essential elements of our Outward life in Christ. And it's first talking to God and talking to people. Talking to God, that's the prayer aspect, and it's going to include talking to God about talking to other people. And the second part, talking to people, is our witness. And it includes talking to people about God. As we seek to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, like Paul's encouraged us, Our goal is that we would be encouraged in our participation in God's saving purposes to the world. He's called us into that. We are participants with them. And and how's that work out for you? We all have different gifts. How's it work out in whatever sphere and relationships that you're in? So let's look at this first element, talking to God. Most of us have a sense that we should pray maybe even a desire to develop a better prayer life. We can so easily get stuck in what we might call a prayer rut, where we kind of go through the same type of prayers, and we say it over and over again, and we start to drift in our praying to other thoughts of the day or tomorrow or the task list, and before we know it, we're not praying anymore, but we're solving problems at work, and we lose focus, and we feel guilty And it's easy to pick on the guilt, but guilt isn't really a good motivator to change us, is it? So before we consider what we're to pray for, we're going to look at the content of prayer. Let's consider, first of all, what it means to be a prayer. What's the manner of prayer? And Paul gives us some hints of this manner, even in just verse 2 of chapter 4, where he says, devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. And just in this manner of prayer, we're going to see three basic elements of this manner of talking to God, which really should have a profound impact on how we pray. And we pray, first of all, devotedly, watchfully, and thankfully. That first element, praying devotedly. That 
word Paul says is devote yourself to prayer. If you have the ESV, it says continue steadfastly in prayer. That There's an assumption here. I, I think when it says continue in the ESV, we get the right sense. It takes it for granted that believers are those who do pray. And he's encouraging us not to grow lax in it. When we talk about devotion, we have this sense of giving yourself to something to give persistent attention to. It's an orientation of my life towards someone or, or something. So now let's think underneath that. Why would I be devoted to anything? How many things in life we feel we should be devoted to, but we don't have underneath it what it takes to actually have the devotion. When you think of Someone who's devoted, maybe a devoted husband and father. Who do you think of? The impression isn't that, okay, he only thinks of his spouse and children once in a while. That wouldn't be a right impression of devotion. No, it involves more. It doesn't mean that's the only thing that he does is is just hang out with his wife and kids. That's not necessarily what it means. But we would have Paul's sense of devotion if we had the idea that, His devotion to his family affects everything in his life, and it causes him to give himself up to them in in many different ways. Then we'd have an understanding of it. And why would someone do that, even with his family? Is it just duty? Is it just a ritual? No, proper devotion, what's it flow out of? Love. We have many loves many devotions. Some people get devoted to a cause. Some people get devoted to a person. Some people get devoted to their cars. All sorts of things. We're all devoted to something. Just look at where you spend your time and what you talk about the most and what consumes your thoughts and you begin to get a pretty good idea of where their devotion lies, right? And Paul says, be devoted to prayer. We should be clear here, Paul's not talking about being devoted to the practice or the act of saying prayers. He's encouraging us about talking to a person, talking to God. That's what prayer is. We have a children's catechism, and it starts out and says, what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God, asking God for things that are agreeable to him, confessing our sins to him, thanking him for all his mercies, and praising him for his greatness. It's a good sense of prayer, fairly all-encompassing. And this is a general term as well. It includes all kinds of praying, but the point in both of those is that it starts out talking to God. Prayer is conscious, personal communication with the God of the universe who made us and brought us into a relationship with himself. We're to be devoted to talking to him. Right? Isn't that what we're talking about? Being devoted to the Lord, having him at the center of our life again. This, of course, is in line what we've seen in this letter already. Going back to the beginning of chapter 3, Paul talks about how your life, if you've trusted in him, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ is our life. So when we are commanded to be devoted to prayer, it needs to be connected to the command to love God, connected to our relationship that we have with him through Christ. And if you think about it, if if Christ isn't my life, something else is. And I'll be devoted to that. But the more I understand and embrace Christ as my life, and the more all-encompassing that will be, then we'll be more devoted. It's so often where we get prayer wrong. Too often we treat prayer as a, an exercise to be performed or a skill to be mastered, and we end up going through the motions, and we pray because we're supposed to pray, like we're supposed to brush our teeth every day, and it just becomes mindless. Doing prayer can actually override fellowship with God. 
There's a danger of focusing too much on prayer sometimes, just thinking about the mechanics. There's nothing wrong with that, but thinking about prayer won't necessarily make you want to pray. It won't make you want to be devoted to God. It's like an example I heard once. Imagine you're talking to a loved one on the phone, and all you think about is the actual phone. You're missing it. All the time on the other end is your Heavenly Father. The goal is to connect to Him. And then we pray about things and our circumstances that we're dealing with and the things that He would have us do. And guess what? He wants us to pray. He calls us to pray. He removed our sin by sending his son to to remove that which separates us from being able to come to him. And this is wonderful news because we are dependent upon him, whether we realize it or not. We can so often kid ourselves and think we're okay without him. At least functionally that's what we do. We might not admit it. But when we don't pray, what are we saying? That's why we need to do what verse 2 says, keep alert. First, I need to pray devotedly, and I also need to pray watchfully. That word, keeping alert or or being watchful, it has the sense of being vigilant in something in order not to miss out. Remember, as a kid on rainy days, we'd sometimes wait inside for the bus to come, and you could look down the road to see if it was coming or listen for it, and if you didn't keep alert, you'd miss the bus. Remember Peter? The night in which he was betrayed, Jesus warned him and said, you're going to deny me three times. I'm not going to deny you. I'll stand with you even if everyone else leaves, he said in his pride. Did he think he needed God's strength when they were in the garden? Mark fourteen thirty-eight. Jesus told him and to others, keep watching and praying. Same words. Keep alert and praying that you may not come into temptation. Peter didn't keep alert. He fell asleep. He fell miserably into sin. And he denied his Lord three times when the temptation came. And he went out and wept bitterly. So it is with us. We're to keep alert in the light of the temptations around us that might take us away from Christ and away from the hope that we have in him. Even in Colossians, look at some of the temptations to come. Chapter 3, verse 8, the things that we're supposed to put off, these are all temptations. We can be tempted to immorality and anger. Verse 18 and following talks about Some things in the home. Think about the tensions that might come between a husband and wife. It's a temptation. The tensions that come between a parent and a child. The temptations that can come between a boss and an employee. How do we deal with all those? Be watchful in prayer. We need the Lord to help us, to to keep us from temptation, to to fighting with wisdom from below instead of wisdom above, and and to keep on task to maintain our hope. And if we understand who he is and who we are and where the battle's at, then we would pray. If someone told you that something was a necessity, really a necessity, you'd do it, wouldn't you? Take this medicine or you will die certain sense of urgency to it. You become pretty vigilant in taking your medicine. If you think prayer is necessary, you'll do it. You'll talk to him. You'll ask for his help. It's not how we are. Sometimes we pray when we don't think there's any other option. Most everybody prays when there's some catastrophe or they're desperate. You've heard the saying, there's no atheists in a foxhole. They want some kind of divine intervention because they have nowhere else to turn, so they throw up a prayer and see what happens. But what if every moment of the Christian life was meant to be lived in a way that was totally dependent upon the Lord? Do you realize it is? If we're going to live effectively for Christ, upward, inward, and outward, 
We need him to enable us. If you want to have the joy and peace of the Lord, you need him to grant it. If you're going to respond rightly in the situations of life, trying to get God instead of just your own way, in leading your home and leading your children and on your job, you need his grace to enable you. If you can have the right focus of life, understand the right purpose, and to pursue it, you're going to need him to incline your heart to do it. Such a good prayer. David says, incline my heart to your testimonies. Why? He knows it's not always that way. And he needs the Lord to help him in it. And if you're going to love others rightly, you need his love to compel you. All these things we can't do without a dependence on the Lord. Like Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It doesn't mean you can't do things, but not the things in the way that he wants us to do it with a devotion to the Lord and a love for others. And prayer is the clearest demonstration that we are utterly helpless to live the Christian life apart from him. So devote yourself to prayer. Pray devotedly. Express the depth of your need for God. And do it watchfully. And the third element in our manner of talking to God is to do it thankfully. We need to come with this attitude of thanksgiving. That's what it says here in our passage. Now, when we talk about thanksgiving, it assumes that I have something to be thankful for. Do you? Your life is hidden in Christ. He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, says in chapter 1. The hope of glory is laid up for you in heaven. And the world may be going down all around you, but that can never be taken away. Oh, what about... What about all the troubles that are around me that that look so stark? I I see these things, and and it's so easy to walk by sight and not by faith. And I say, how can this be good? Paul says, the momentary light afflictions that I'm going through, Paul went through a lot, are not worthy to be, be compared to the weight of glory that we're going to receive when I'm with my Savior. There's something to be thankful for. We might say, I'm not there yet. How can I be thankful in all these difficulties? Sometimes we think, okay, I can be thankful for the forgiveness of sins. We have this notion of expressing gratitude for things in the past, previous acts of kindness, And that's right. We we do have the forgiveness of sins. We've been adopted, made children. We're justified. We know that we're God's children and he loves us. And and he works in our lives, too, every day. We can lay down our head and we can probably give thanks for the blessings we've received. Count your blessings, name them one by one. But the part we often forget is that thanksgiving can also be forward-looking. We say thank you for things. If someone hands you something, you have it now, and we say thank you. But but look, think about just sitting at the dinner table. You pray before the meal. You haven't eaten it yet, but it's in my sights. I give thanks for the delights of enjoying it and the nourishment that my body will receive that I'm about to partake of. Let me tell you what, in Christ, though, We should always have heaven in our sights. It's ours. It's there before us. I know it's mine. And I'm looking forward to partaking. And then I can live in thankfulness, even in the midst of things that might not be going like I think, but is in God's good control. I I know we've experienced this firsthand when we're not thankful We're usually discontent. We start looking at other places. We 
take our eyes off the devotion to the Lord and we fix our hope in so many other things instead of what he is to us in our lives. But what God has given us, so that his future acts of kindness, is, it, it is already a victory that's been obtained. It's ours. It belongs to us. He's, he's accomplished it for us. And Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the, the hope that's of the resurrection, he says, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have that thankfulness. And this attitude, then, then we pray for this proclamation of Christ's victory to go to others, that they might be brought into this hope. And that now takes us to the next part of talking to God. What's the specific content? We've seen some of the manner of praying, but now what do we talk about? What's the content of our praying? Verse 3, Paul moves to prayer for himself and to others who are engaged in ministry with him. Pray for us as well. Pray that God will open up a door for us in the word. And, and he goes on, and, and, and that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. The way I ought to speak. That phrase there, praying for us as well, Paul knows they have many other things to pray for. Paul says, Please pray for me too. Isn't Paul the great apostle? Bold proclaimer of truth? Yes. And he recognizes that apart from Christ, he can do nothing too. He says, I don't want to walk this alone. Pray for me. He doesn't have any pride, he doesn't have any problem admitting his need and dependence. Do you ever ask people to pray for you? Some of you walk things alone because you don't want to let others walk with you. It doesn't have to be well, so easy to, to ask how you can pray for others. Paul says, these people who you pray for, let them pray for you. That's what Paul did. Paul prays for them all the time, beginning of the letter again, verse 9. Since the day we heard about you, we haven't ceased to pray for you. I pray for you. Pray for me. Why? Why prayer? It's not just talking for the relationship aspect of things. We pray because there's this glorious wonder in the universe that the all-knowing, all-wise, all-sovereign God has ordained to use our prayers and respond to those prayers to accomplish the things he's ordained. Now, how do we understand those things? But, but God ordains the means as well as the ends. He ordains that it would rain, but he ordained that Elijah would pray that it would rain. He ordains that Paul would speak boldly. He ordains that people would pray for him, and God would answer that prayer, and he would speak boldly. Paul he wants what God can do, not what he can do. And so before his human act of speaking the gospel, and that's what he's talking about here with the, the mystery of Christ in verse 3, the, the revealed truth that God's saving work is all centered in Christ. Before his act of speaking the gospel, he asked them to pray. You talk to God about me talking to people. You see what's going on here? To Paul, prayer isn't simply just presenting your own private, personal wishes and desires to God. Instead, it's a way for believers to participate in God's unfolding redemptive plan in history. You see, a key aspect of evangelism is done on our knees with God. You realize that? Upward, inward, outward, we're outward even in our closet. If we're praying to the Lord, we participate in what's going on. Sometimes we have this mindset, we have lost friends or something, and our, our goal is to bring them to church. Let the preacher save them. That's fine, bring people to church. But don't just lay that responsibility on just the preacher. Don't lay it on me. I can't change hearts. 
Let God change his hearts. Lay it before the Lord. Even if you don't preach, pray. It's not just a ritual to be performed. It's a critical means through which the gospel mission is advanced and accomplished. And you are part of it through prayer. Not everyone has a gift of preaching. Maybe not teaching, but can still be involved. That inward, outward, and upward is something that you are still supposed to be involved in. Together we're involved in it. Different gifts, different roles. We're all called to pray. And as you pray, Paul says, I'll proclaim. And through that, others who don't know Christ might come to know him. And so Paul says, pray for me, for an open door for the word. Notice he didn't say, pray for an open door for me, but pray for an open door for the word. Where's Paul? Paul's in prison when he's writing this. He's not praying that he would get out of prison. That's not his primary concern. Remember Philippians? He wrote Philippians when he was in jail. And Paul says, here I am sitting in prison. And when my, my going to jail, it didn't hinder the gospel. It opened doors. Philippians 1.12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me being put in prison has really served to advance the gospel. And Christ is proclaimed, and I rejoice in that. Paul just wants to be used by God wherever he is. When we see examples like this, it should move us to reassess our own prayers. What do we do? We so often focus that God will change our circumstances. And we shouldn't focus so much on changing our circumstances, but start praying that God will enable us to respond in the right way in the midst of our circumstances so that more people would come to know him because we're in those circumstances. That's a big difference in how we pray. I had a professor who, he talked about a, a man with an illness, I don't know if it was cancer or something like that, and it's fine to pray for being healed, but there was something bigger that they were encouraged to pray for. Here, he's going in for treatment, and he's praying about opportunities. He's saying, you're spending all those hours down at the doctor's office anyhow, Why not pray for opportunities to speak forth as he ought the excellencies of Christ? That's what Paul did in prison. I tell you what, we have this open door theology, so to speak, and and what's that say? It says, hey, if there's an open opportunity for me to get something good for myself, then I should take it. Right? Open opportunity for a better job or an open opportunity for a spouse or an open opportunity for a good deal on something. Not, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but, but Paul's open door here is for the word going forth. You know, let's think of an example of that. Acts 16, Paul gets thrown in jail for his ministry there in Philippi. And he's unjustly, he got beat up. And there's this miraculous earthquake that opens the cell doors of the prison without destroying the prison. There's a literal open door that he could escape through and go out. But there's also another open door. There's a jailer there who would be a dead man if all the prisoners left. Which open door did Paul take? He stayed in the cell. He got the opportunity to share Christ with the jailer. And he spoke the word of the Lord to him, and he believed. Paul already had life. The jailer didn't. Pray for me, Paul says, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Apostle Paul again. He knew the gospel as clear as anybody. And he asked for prayer. He knew his dependence on God. I think he also knew his own weaknesses too and that It was the Lord who helped him overcome. He wasn't trying to do it in his own strength. We go to Philippians 1 again, and we see as he talks about his time in prison, he says in Philippians 1.19, I know that through your prayers 
and the help of the Spirit of Christ, then I won't be ashamed. He'll be delivered, and I, I think that deliverance is that he won't be ashamed, meaning he won't back down from his testimony to Christ in the midst of these trials that he's going to face. He's not going to give in. He's going to be strengthened by God through the means of others' prayers, and he is confident that God will deliver him that way, that he won't be ashamed. What a way to pray. You ever pray that way? For, for, for missionaries, for pastors, for Wayne, for me? For others who are sharing Christ with someone, even yourself? Not just that the lost would believe, but that we would speak as we ought. See, we need to remember, for any outward, we should first be going upward. Or during and after. We need to talk to God about talking to people. So that's one part of being outward. And and now our our second point, the other part, is talking to people about God, our own witness. And this fits right in. Here we're talking about how you speak to people as we go to verse 5. And how we speak to them or or proclaim to them, I would say, through both your words and your deeds. Look what Paul says here. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. There you have it, conduct and speech. All geared toward outsiders. So what's an outsider? Not just someone out there in the snow. This is someone who are not part of the household of faith, unbelievers. This isn't a derogatory term. This is just a matter of fact. Those who haven't professed faith in Christ. So the question that Paul's implicitly addressing here is how do outsiders become insiders? And of course, the answer is it's through the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. But also, it comes through our living and how I speak to people and conduct my life. Yes, faith comes by hearing, but it seems to also come by seeing. Have you ever thought about that? What's Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5? Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, works that are commendable, attractive. They say, may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This fascinating passage in 1 Peter, talking about wives submitting to themselves to their husbands, even to the ones who don't believe, so that these unbelieving husbands, these disobedient husbands, may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Fascinating. That's why Peter said earlier, keep your behavior, keep your conduct Excellent among unbelievers because it has an evangelistic impact. All over we we see there's proclamation with our lips and proclamation with our lives. And we are to live our lives in a way that fleshes out the reality of the changing power of Jesus Christ. And we need wisdom to do that rightly. Conduct yourselves with wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom. It's the ability to understand and apply the Lord's principles to our living, right? That's what wisdom is, real wisdom. How do I live with with principle-driven lordship life? How do I do that? Well, I can say what it isn't. It isn't living like the world to win the world. This is what you hear sometimes. People take a verse out of context from Paul's letter to the Corinthians and say, I become all things to all people. And, and so we think that I should become like the world so I can speak to them. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about giving up your personal freedoms so that you will have an opportunity that's, that's not necessary to actually be in their lives and speak the truth. But it doesn't say that I should become worldly to point them to godliness. That's not what it's talking about. No, wisdom is how to live with Christ as Lord. That's what Paul's been talking about here. So that people see the difference and they might ask why it's different. 
This is so important. What's the negative side? If we live our lives so poorly that we're just like the world, then they won't hear us when we talk about how precious Christ is when we give them up every day and do other things. It doesn't match. You know, we're, we're called to live it out. And, and sometimes we think, okay, we, we, we learn gospel presentations. We should go out evangelizing. That's fine. But sometimes that's a lot easier just going out and giving a stranger a gospel presentation than your neighbor. The stranger doesn't know how you live. Your neighbor does. Now, are you, are you going to speak in a way that's consistent with how you live or vice versa? But positively, if you live with the hope of glory and in love that's compelled by God's love, you're compassionate, you're kind, you're, you're humble, you're patient, you're forgiving others, these are the things, chapter 3, we're supposed to put on, then people begin to see the reality of Christ in you. Do you know that most conversions, some people take statistics, I don't know how they gather these things, but apparently most conversions don't come from a church program or even professional ministries, but most come through friends and neighbors who share their faith. Our lives have an impact. We can be part of the outward. Your neighbors who watch your life, they'll see how you interact with your family, how you're considerate to them, how you help them out, how you handle hardship, even suffering. And when we handle it the Lord's ways, and sometimes that can be even confessing our weakness and our need, if we humble repentance, when we handle it that way with the Lord's hope and the Lord's grace and pointing to him, that's making the most of every opportunity. You remember Paul back in Philippi in the jail again? Treated unjustly, and what's he doing at night? Praying and singing hymns to God. I'm guessing that wasn't the first thought of many of the other prisoners in there. Make the most of every opportunity, or as the old King James says, redeem the time. That's one of those verses that gets used out of context for time management seminars, trying to help you be more efficient with all your task lists. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not the point of the passage. It's more literally buying up time. Making the most of opportunity is a good translation. It's using this life to exalt Christ on on how you live and speak until he comes again. Because we're living in light of, of Christ being right there. We see it. It's ours. It's our hope. And we're redeeming the time while we're here, or we're buying up the time while we're here. We're to be outward. Right In heaven, we're, we're going to be totally upward because we're being praising God unhinderedly. I made up a word. We're going to be perfectly like Christ. We'll be like him, but we won't have an opportunity to be outward. So he has left us here for that purpose. As we worship God, become like Christ, and proclaim his excellencies. So when we think about this, There's some implications. Our outward doesn't need to be limited to some five-minute gospel track presentation. This is considering actually something that's a little bit longer, more involved pursuit. From them seeing your life, they see it, and it might bring them to ask, what makes you tick? All this stuff's going down, and, and you have hope. Why do you live that way? Notice verse 6. Paul says that you know how to respond. By putting it this way, Paul's assuming that that the outsiders are going to be raising questions about the faith of the Colossian Christians. That they would have an opportunity to speak. It's like in 1 Peter 3.15. That they might ask for the reason for the hope that's in you. In the context of that is when you're suffering. And then you answer them. You give the reason. You point to Christ. Yes, our response communicates the content of the gospel. That really is where our hope is. But 
it's also done in a certain manner that will make the gospel attractive. Let your speech always be with grace. As though seasoned with salt, verse 6. It's going to be gracious. It's not trying to clobber. It's trying to be winsome. So often we can try and win an argument instead of point others to, to God's grace that they need. The speech part is, is sometimes where we get hung up. I know some of us have a hard time speaking. We can say, oh, I, I get so fearful or, or I clam up. I don't know what to say. I, I get all twisted back on myself. I think we can understand that. And we can all grow. We can get involved in learning opportunities. Even on Sunday with, with this Listen Up book, our, our goal is not just that you hear, but you learn these things so that you can teach them to others, proclaim them to others so they become part of your fabric. It's not just to take it in and, and let it go, but say, how do I live this out? How can I be equipped for ministry? But even apart from that, the first words for this outward focus are pray and then live out a certain way in our behavior. Let your light shine that others would see. And then know where your hope is. Know in whom you've believed. To, to be ready to give a reason for the hope we have, you've got to be hopeful first. Understand what that hope is. And then tell people when they ask. And there's one more thing. Deal with people as people. Notice that last phrase in verse 6. Paul says, to each person. Know how to respond to each person. The implication, there's, there, there's something individual going on here. It's talking about the significance of talking to a person according to their own understanding, their own circumstances, their own struggles. Deal with people as people, not, not just giving them some canned thing, one size fits all. Same gospel, yes, we should know those things. But deal with an individual. Care enough about the person. Deal with that life that's in front of you. Walk with them. Understand where they are. Listen to their doubts, their fears, their hurts, and point them to Christ. This is how we live outwardly. First, we talk to God about people. Then we talk to people about God. As we grow in our own life in Christ and in wisdom and living at the Lordship of Christ, he will give us opportunities. Let's pray together that the Lord would use us and and bring a harvest. that We might rejoice and be part of his purposes. Father, we come before you and ask that you would indeed fill us with all knowledge and spiritual wisdom, that we would know how to conduct ourselves that we would know our deep dependence upon you and that you'd be pleased to help us. Let's pray for one another, use our prayers, that we would grow in our outward life in Christ even as we become like him, even as we trust in you more and more and see your wonderful worth in Christ for us. Let us be careful to give you all the thanks and praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. His 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 name.